Um, and since the threat has grown, we must uh, do more to, to defend our, our, our territory. Philippine President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. speaking to us exclusively on the growing threat he sees from China. More from that interview ahead. It's almost 11 a.m. in Singapore and here in Manila. Welcome to Bloomberg Markets Asia. I'm Haslinda Amin. Here are the top stories. Stocks in Asia trade mixed after U.S. equities touch fresh highs. Bond futures rally as traders brace for the latest Fed decision. Emerging market currencies extending their longest losing streak since June, with traders increasingly convinced the Fed will cut rates later rather than sooner. And Indian stocks poised to erase this year's gains as regulatory warnings of growing froth in the market weigh on sentiment. And speaking of markets, let's get you to markets. Avril Hong in Singapore is keeping tabs. And Avril, we see Asian stocks giving up all gains, the dollar up. For a fifth day, you get a sense that market's looking for a hawkish tone from the Fed. Yeah, I think that is the base case. That is the expectation from the U.S. Central Bank. And as we wait to hear just the pace of easing we're going to get from the world's most influential uh, central bank this year, we're seeing markets pretty mixed. Uh, some gains in Korea, slight decline in China. Uh, and as we wait for that, we already got today the monetary policy coming out from China in the form of that loan prime rate. This was left unchanged as expected uh, after the MLF last week was left unchanged. But that doesn't seem to matter for the bond bulls in China. They're saying, hey, we're expecting more uh, stimulus to come, more easing on the uh, Chinese front. So that's pushing up and you can see how the yields, it's like a question of how low can you go in China. Now, as we keep an eye on China monetary policy, we also are really cognizant of what we got out of Japan yesterday, the historic rate decision, as well as uh, Ueda not letting on on very much. The takeaway for markets is clearly that it's going to remain accommodative and and whatever tightening or normalization we're going to get, that's going to be gradual. The yen moving to levels we haven't seen since November uh, last year against the greenback, against the euro. It's weakened to its lowest level since uh, 2008 at one point. So that's what we're seeing in the cross-asset space for now in the Asia-Pacific cars. Well, after the BOJ, the Fed in focus, what are we expecting? Yeah, I think uh, the focus is really going to be on those dots, right? We had CPI and PPI data recently showing that inflation is persistent. So the expectation for the market is from a trim from three to two. And going forward, we are also potentially uh, seeing Fed's Powell's tone, right? That's going to be another focus because of how he seems a bit more sensitive to the slowing economic activity data recently. So there are some in the market markets who think that maybe we're going to get a bit of a dovish surprise. Uh, we're also going to be keeping a close eye out on any comments surrounding quantitative tightening. The Fed has a lot of questions to answer surrounding its balance sheet. Now let's flip the board because I think Treasuries are already uh, pricing in this really hawkish turn from the Federal Reserve. So anything uh, about that might have already uh, peaked when we talk about the Treasury market. So uh, we're seeing the futures actually extending the rally on the day. And also this was helped along by that strong 20-year auction, Haas. Avril, thank you so much for that. Amazing when you think about it, right? We started with expectations of seven cuts for the year. It's down to three, and now we may just see two. Now, speaking of the BOJ, the BOJ's historic decision failed to send the yen to higher ground, and now the onus is on the Fed for directional clarity across foreign exchange markets. Let's bring in Satyandi Supaant, head of 
FX Research at Maybank. Uh, Saktiandi, I mean, clarity? I don't even think we'll get clarity from the Fed. Yeah, so indeed, yeah, it's, um, I think what happened from BOJ yesterday, I think expectations uh, were hoping for a bit more uh, sort of guidance, very clear guidance on the tightening. But on the Fed front, uh, yeah, so the, what, what was shared earlier about the pricing now, it's about 72 basis points cut by end 2024. That's slightly less than the three cuts that the December dot plot. So the dot plots will be key. Uh, and I think markets in some ways are a slightly uh, over aggressive, possibly in, in terms of the hawkish repricing, especially when you saw ISM manufacturing services and retail sales are sort of slowed as well. How do you position then? You take a look at the dollar right now up for a fifth day in a row. Dollar strength, dollar exceptionalism likely to continue from here, you think? Yeah, we, we've been calling for US dollar strength and exceptionalism to continue at the very least into uh, in the middle of probably second quarter of this year before falling off. But I think the cuts, uh, we, are, we are looking at cuts probably coming in in the third quarter of uh, this year. Um, so the question is, probably Powell's guidance today will actually sway a bit uh, in terms of whether he's going to shift towards a bit more, more even intense dovish sort of uh, guidance, but we, we will watch that. Our view is, I think, if we uh, today's dot plots uh, remains unchanged, I think we can expect dollar and uh, US Treasury yields uh, to fall. In terms of yields, we've seen how yields have been trending higher year end. Where do you see ten year yields headed? Uh, ten, year, ten year yields headed in uh, given our dollar view towards the end of the year, I would expect uh, Treasury yields to fall off. I think our house view is closer towards uh, the four percent and slightly below four percent by the end of the year. Uh, it can possibly happen. I think yields can move uh, significantly. Um, uh, following of the Fed rate cuts and probably if there's any slowdown in terms of uh, data out of the US. But I, I'd like to point out globally, I think services inflation numbers will continue to be sticky. And I think most central banks, I think in the region or even globally, are continuing to be a bit wary of uh, services inflation. And of course, there are structural sort of inflation drivers as well, uh, decarbonization and others, which continue to be uh, a major issue. Uh, you talk about tunnel banks in the region. Most are waiting for the Fed. How do you position? What are the best crosses you should be playing right now? It's not just about dollar yen. Yeah, yeah. In, in, uh, I think in, in terms of uh, plays, I think there's some thematics that we have in terms of the region. I think we, we're playing a bit more uh, some of the electronic cycles sort of upswing possibly in later part in the year. So I think North Asia, Korean won, Taiwan dollar. To some extent, we are still positive on the Sing dollar. We, we are unlikely to shift in terms of sing dollar, seeing any possible sing dollar or MS moves uh, at, in, uh, at as early as probably even up to third quarter of this year. So some crosses with the sing dollar in terms of long sing dollar relative to some of the regional currencies. And then in terms of some of the North Asians uh, currencies like Korean won, but uh, we, we do see some positive upsides on in terms of Euro uh, and CNH probably early on in the week and last week. Uh, but I think in terms of Asia, we are still positive on Sing dollar relative to some of the Asian uh, uh, regional currencies. It's also interesting to note that last year we saw how central banks were pretty much in sync. You know, we talk about synchronization of central bank policy, but we're not seeing that anymore this year. Are there opportunities to trade on this theme? Yeah, there's, there's some um, sort of in terms of lag. I think there's some distinct sort of central banks which uh, may actually take some time before the cut will be a bit more stubborn or sticky, probably on the uh, RBNZ front of things. And then as you saw yesterday, RBA has shifted slightly. Uh, but I think most are actually still waiting for our, uh, the Fed to actually move. So I think indications of when the Fed would move first. But I think in terms of the spectrum of things, I think some central banks in the Asia pack, for example, on the Kiwi front, uh, would be a bit lag. And then some of the earlier ones would be on the Canadian dollar, uh, and all that would move first. In the in the uh, sort of Eurozone area, I think there could be some uh, impact or domestic sort of drivers that may sort of delay a bit in terms of uh, on the sterling and also on the Eurozone front. Like so. so yes, indeed, there's a spectrum that, that you can play in Asia. I think the sticky inflation sort of factor uh, in terms of sticky services inflation 
I think could actually also hamper a bit of moves on uh, some of the regional central banks. In particular, I think MES and on the Sing dollar front. You've not really touched on emerging market currencies, the likes of the ringgit, the likes of the Indonesian um, rupiah. We know that the Malaysian currency has been under a lot of pressure. And the RDI, even though BI wants to move, it is holding pat because of the Fed. I mean, how do you see emerging market currencies performing? So BI is key because I think today we have the BI decision. Uh, we're looking for uh, BI to actually stand pat, actually, to keep the rate at about 6%. But I think the key thing from Indonesia is we, we still think growth will continue to hold up there. I think inflation remains rather well behaved. I think the key thing is I think they're waiting for the Fed in some ways. Policy normalization is, is likely to happen only after the Fed starts uh, easing. And I think the aim is also to impact um, uh, the impact on the rupiah. I think they want to mitigate the impact on the rupiah. On ringgit front, we continue to hold the view that uh, ringgit uh, is undervalued. We think um, it's moving around those levels that we have forecasted around at 470 range now. It's predicated by dollar moves. We're looking at ringgit probably strengthening towards 440, 450 range towards the end of the year as the dollar as the dollar sort of falls off a bit in the second half after the Fed moves and I think Treasury yields falls off. So some of the uh, sort of interest rate differential sort of uh, drivers for the ringgit actually will fall off. Uh, and I think ringgit will actually uh, swing back down to about five, uh, 450 levels from current levels uh, in our view, unless there's some uh, shocks uh, globally. But I think we remain be, I think, ex uh, strengthening in our view towards the later part of the year that could actually add some uh, balance of support to the ringgit. Speaking of shocks, what do you think is the biggest risk to all your projections right now? Would it be the Fed? Would it be geopolitics? I think it will be the Fed, and I, I think in some ways inflation differentials will be key. Um, like I mentioned, I keep repeating this, uh, uh, the risk of sticky services inflation globally <laughs> uh, uh, it will, will be a major decision for some of the central bank moves. And in terms of quantum, and in terms of, and we look at how, what BOJ is doing, uh, did yesterday in terms of guidance, I think they're concerned about um, uh, wage pressures feeding in services inflation, and also in the fact that I think they need it to be uh, paced in a different manner, slower pace, milder pace, so that it doesn't affect the economy. And the Fed also has been like a broken record, right? It's been saying yes, yes. it is higher yes. for longer. Who's listening? Well, we don't really know. Sakti Andi Sipan, head of FX Research at Maybank, we thank you so much for your time today. Well, still to come, my exclusive interview with Philippine President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. We discuss his ambitious economic growth goals as well as the rising tensions in the South China Sea. And later on, Stratbase Institute shares their insights on that territorial dispute, as well as the Philippines' moves to boost ties with the U.S. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back and let's zoom in on the Philippines. President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. says he's not seeking confrontation with China, even as his country works harder to assert its territorial claims in disputed waters. He spoke to me exclusively at the presidential palace here in Manila. The threat has grown. Um, and since the threat has grown, we must uh, do more to, to defend our, our uh, territory. And uh, so maybe perhaps that's what that has, uh, what we people people are seeing uh, is that a more robust defense of our of our territorial rights uh, as uh, recognized by the international community through international law through the UNCLOS um, and, and we, we we hew very close to that we we do not we do not leave uh, very. Uh, we, not, we have not instigated any kind of conflict. We have not instigated any kind of confrontation. We are just trying to feed our people. The but U.S. has weighed in. It constantly points to Article 5 of the Mutual Defense Agreement, mm -hmm. which was signed in 1951. Yeah. It now says that it now extends to all armed conflicts, mm -hmm. armed attacks mm -hmm. in all, in any area of the South China Sea. In practice, mm -hmm. what exactly does that mean? That uh, an a, a incursion, for example, uh, to occupy, uh, which has already happened, but we are still trying to, 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 to keep it uh, uh, peaceful, 
But you see, we are avoiding, we avoid, as I said, we think about peace in the, in the national interest. It is, it does not serve any purpose to heighten tensions, to say, okay, I am invoking now the mutual defense treaty. And uh, that, that I don't think anyone wants that unless You've asked a very difficult question here. Um, <laughs> unless, unless the the effects are such that it is a threat, it is it will become an existential threat to the country. Then I think it's very easy to say that uh, that 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 would uh, that would trigger uh, the the mutual defense treaty, the agreement between the United States and the Philippines. How confident are you about U.S. support? How far do you think the U.S. would go to support the Philippines in the South China Sea? Well, that, thus far, uh, we, we can say that the United States has been very, uh, certainly very supportive in every, in every way. And, um, and it has, uh, the United States has really uh, shown uh, that it takes very seriously these agreements that we have. And so, but it is dangerous for one to think in terms of when something goes wrong, we'll run to Big Brother. Uh, that, that's not the way we treat it at all. I say we, 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 we do this for ourselves. We do this because we feel that we have to do it. And it's not at the behest or at the, of, of the United States. Just to follow up on that, how... Confident are you the U.S. is willing to go to war with China over a disputed reef in the South China Sea? Oh, God. Uh, you, how far is the U.S. prepared to go? What are your talks suggesting to you? Well, I, I really... Uh, we, we would... That, to take, the, take the, a step back from that question is that that is precisely what we want to avoid. Uh, we want to do everything we possibly can, together with our partners and allies, to avoid that situation whatsoever. This is the, this is not this is not the uh, uh, poking the the bear, as it were. Uh, we are trying quite to do, to do quite the opposite. You know, we are trying to to keep things uh, at the at the manageable level. Uh, to continue the dialogues, whatever they are, at every level. And we have initiated many of those dialogues. At the, we have dialogues at the sub-ministerial level, at the ministerial level, and at the executive level. And so I think that that's what we have to continue because uh, it, it, it would... The, the, there are many volatilities in the area, in the region. Back in May, you talked about how... Philippine military bases will not be used for offensives no. against China. No. Do you still maintain that position? Yes, of course, of course. We have no, we have no interest in in, in attacking anything or anyone. Uh, not at all. Uh, that, that is the furthest thing from our mind. Uh, that, no, we would not. We would not allow that uh, unless we're at war, perhaps. But. We, that's why. That's why. That's why we want to keep away from that uh, that situation as uh, as as much as we can for 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 and maintain that. Uh, maybe it's an uh, it could you you could describe it as an uneasy peace, but it's peace nonetheless. You're sitting on one of the fastest growing mm. countries in Asia. Is that sustainable? Can you achieve six and a half to seven and a half percent growth for the year, for instance? I think so. I think uh, well, much of much of the policies that we uh, that we've uh, uh, taken on are are really to 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 spur growth. It, uh, that's part of the most that's the most important part because it is only growth that will pull us out of uh, this the, the morass that was left after the pandemic. And uh, uh, even in terms of inter even in terms of debt ratios, even in terms of uh, uh, unemployment, in, in terms of inflation, it really is growth. It, it, that, 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 that seems to be the key. Is it sustainable if we continue down this road, if we defend all of the things that we are doing? I believe it is. Um, I believe it is. If we are also agile, 
in terms of responding to the shocks that come up come up uh, from other from from the outside, uh, to put it that way, uh, shocks that we cannot control or can have very little influence over, if any. So that's the, that will be the key. It's a six-year term. Do you think you can get to eight percent within the six oh. years that you're in office? Sure. Why not? Um, uh, you know, uh, there, there's no. We plan. We always plan for the ideal. We don't plan for uh, the, a, a mediocre result. We plan for a very good result. Um, and as I said, we just have to adjust along the way as we, as we uh, uh, continue to to transform the economy. But yes, I, I think it is. I think it is doable. Several banks are currently in focus because of interest rates. In the Philippines, rates are at, I think, 17-year highs. How much room is there for you to cut rates, or rather the BSP to cut rates? We're still battling inflation. Uh, inflation is still our biggest uh, problem. Uh, that we, and when you, when you separate core inflation to inflation that involves agri-products, for example, uh, you can see that the core inflation, we're doing rather well in terms of controlling it. But again, these, these shocks that keep coming in. But still not quite the time to cut rates because inflation is still sticky. Perhaps uh, it, it, we, we look at it all, almost every, every week uh, to see if it's time to, to, to bring down the rates. We are not yet there. And the peso at a three-month high? Are you comfortable with I'm so, the, the peso? The, the peso? peso at a three yes, month because it's an indication of the strength of the economy. Um, there is a downside to it for the Philippines because of our overseas workers, where the dollar is worth a little less than it normally would be. But uh, I, I see it as an, as an affirmation that the economy has, has grown stronger. Our exclusive with Philippine President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. Plenty more ahead. Keep it here with us. This is Bloomberg. I think um, the general market sentiment is that property has been a challenging sector. Um, a lot of property funds and property corporates have actually pulled out of China. Uh, we think that's short-sighted. Right? We, we want to be in China long-term. We've invested in there. We have a lot of infrastructure and networks, and that allows us to keep our ear close to the ground. And in fact, what we're looking at now is some of the equity plays. So we're moving into the equity markets now, as opposed to all allocating more to the bond markets. Mm. We don't want to get locked in. Nearly all of our funds are at core money, so we're a very different type of player than those distressed players. So we need to be in the liquid parts of markets. You know, it's, a, it's very hard for the both sides from the... Uh, property sector side and the company uh, from the uh, investor side to have a consensus, right? So the uh, right now the uh, sector is changing fundamentally, and it is very hard for us to perceive the near even the near future of the sector. And uh, one of the challenges we are facing is the the visibility of the sector is very low. Some of the panelists from the first ever Bloomberg China Credit Forum in Hong Kong earlier today. And speaking of Hong Kong, Hong Kong, China had it to launch. Uh, and of course, this on the back of the LPR being unchanged, pretty much expected. But remember, if it had moved, it would have surprised markets and would have given a boost to market sentiment. Here's a look at markets had it to launch. Keep it here with us. This is Bloomberg. Financial conditions would tell you that monetary policy is not yet sufficiently restrictive. Outside of maybe loan growth and housing, it's difficult, in, in my view, to find sectors of the economy that had obvious interest rate effects. The Fed has latitude that a lot of places don't have, that they can be hold restrictive and let the economy really catch up. You're at a point where positioning is starting to turn more positive on economically sensitive themes. Rates at some point should move lower. They've got to be careful they don't overshoot. Are they going to show three cuts or two cuts? We I think it stays at three, but it's going to be a very close call. There's a little uncertainty about when to start. The June meeting is now right around 50-50 in terms of whether the Fed will go or not. If we don't get them, I think that's the risk for some of these more credit-sensitive areas like real estate, like, you know, small caps writ large. It is a bit of a pivotal point, we think, for markets. 
Welcome back. Some B of A leaders there discussing the Fed in a special Bloomberg surveillance broadcast from the bank's New York headquarters. Well, let's do a check on markets. China headed to launch. Japan back from break. April Hong with the very latest. April, hi. Hi, Haas. Yeah, we're focusing on those U.S. Treasury markets. Futures not giving us that much direction, though we saw a bit of green coming into today uh, that rally after a strong 20-year auction. It's really about how the ideas coming through that we are really pricing for a hawkish Fed turn. Maybe uh, the worst is over. So we're seeing some of that coming through in the future space uh, today, at least. Let's flip the board and take a look at Japan as well, Haas, as you say. Uh, we're seeing the uh, reaction still, I think, filtering through from what we got yesterday from the Japanese Central Bank. Uh, really, the idea that it's going to be keeping things accommodative, it's going to be gradually tightening, normalizing, if at all. Uh, and the equity space is really piling on, rejoicing in a way, uh, to that idea. Futures are pointing to gains at the open tomorrow, potentially. Uh, and we also have those uh, bond futures. Uh, slight pullback from yesterday. Remember that very mention of how the J BOJ is going to keep up this JGB purchase, the amount more or less the same. Uh, we saw that relief rally. So there's a bit of a pullback there. And of course, the attention is really shifting uh, to the Fed now. Haas. That's right. Japan on holiday is going to play catch up tomorrow. Post Fed. Avril Hong, thank you so much for that. Now to geopolitics. I spoke exclusively with Philippine President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. about the growing tensions with Beijing in the South China Sea. Take a listen. It does not serve any purpose to heighten tensions. That is precisely what we want to avoid. This is not, this is not the uh, uh, poking the, the bear, as it were. Uh, we are trying quite to, to, to do quite the opposite. Let's get insights, put things in perspective. Our next guest says there is consensus among Filipinos that the government must work with the U.S. amid tensions in the South China Sea. Joining us now is Victor Manhit, president of the Stratbase Institute, an advisory and research consultancy group. Victor, to have you with us. So... It is necessary for the U.S. to work with Manila. And, of course, this week alone, in fact, just yesterday, we had uh, Secretary of State uh, Blinken in town to talk, presumably, about relations. Yes, as Linda, when you look at where we are, given a new government uh, in 2022, there was this uh, assertion by Filipinos that they would like our own president to assert our rights at, in terms of defending our territorial integrity. And it came with the idea that who should we work with? And we have been tracking this for two quarters since 2022 and even in 2023. We saw that there was this broad range of 70 to 80 percent of Filipinos trust the U.S., wants us to work with the U.S., not only in security matters, but even in ensuring strength in the economy for the Philippines, side by side with national security. But what form exactly should that take? And I guess, to what level should the U.S. participate, especially in the South China Sea? You need to see it from the broader policy of President Marcos Jr. He does not see it simply as choosing the U.S. over China, but our president has shown that he's willing to work with countries that share the values of a rules-based order, that share democratic values. And part of this is that not only the U.S., but other like-minded nations. That's why you have, you have seen him engage with Australia, with Japan, with European nations. So we, we see this as a strategy of the president to broaden support. We have won from a legal point of view in terms of what is ours based on international law. But of course, to assert it, we might not have the capacity today. But if we can build collective deterrence among countries that believe on the importance of West Philippine Sea as a trade route, importance of West Philippine Sea and even Eastern side, we call mm. the Philippine rice, on take, taking off on data flows, that means uh, submarine cables, would support 
that we need that kind of support to work together, but not necessarily to help us intervene. You know, it's about really deterrence to ensure peace and stability in the region. I want to talk about that pivot to the U.S. for this um, Marcus administration, bearing in mind that coming into office, um, he promised to follow the foreign policy of uh, the previous government, yes. Duterte, uh, and that is to stay close to China, yet he's made that pivot. I mean, to your understanding, what prompted that move? My initial understanding is based, again, on data that we have tracked in our institute. When you see numbers like 90% of Filipinos would like us to assert our rights, that means the president to assert this right. I think that was enough reason to pivot. But more than that is the engagement that they experience from like-minded nations. When he asserted his rights, he saw the support that we have among these nations. And we, what we saw, parallel to this, is Chinese aggressiveness, <laughs> coercion. So I think it placed the president on this position that who is the greatest threat to security in the Philippines? It's China. Considering that six years of Duterte administration, we did not benefit from it. What we provided, that the Duterte administration, was simply appeasement. Some would even say, some critics would even say subservient, but that we get no investments, a weaker defense posture. But now, we feel that we are in a better position. Engagement, not only in national security, but even providing economic security for the Philippine Republic. How far do you think the president is willing to go? He says he does not want to poke the bear. So it is a cautious approach. But how far do you think he's willing to go? I think as long as countries uh, are willing to build maritime cooperation, we have seen discussions at the start, joint exercise, but this year we have seen joint patrols. I think this is enough to deter China and also our, the government's policy to be transparent. That means we want to see the world. Uh, we want to show the world what is happening outside our, outside our seas, within our territory, based on international law. So that kind is, I believe, the direction of the president, but he will continue to build and build relationship, not only with the U.S. I don't think this government would like to be drawn into our U.S.-China strategic rival. It has nothing to do with that. It has something to do with protecting what is the Filipino people's territorial integrity and maritime rights based on an international rules-based order. A lot has to do with the energy resources in the South China Sea. The Philippines has said that it wants to go ahead with uh, exploration in the South China Sea. I'm just wondering, is it realistic to even think of doing that without perhaps instigating a confrontation with China? That is, uh, it's good to understand where it comes from. Areas which are now being contested by China were not contested by them until geological findings showed that there might be natural gas. So imagine how suddenly they encroach on Philippine territory that we call West Philippine Sea because suddenly sub submarine or maybe you'd say geological research team found something. But the good thing also is that that's not the only place where we have those natural gases. But the best is for, for us to realize that our relationship with the U.S. should not be limited on military cooperation. Maybe we need them to explore with us or not only the U.S., but even European oil and gas companies to explore with us to ensure that natural gas can be extracted because we might be rich on it. Mm. <laughs> and it's a transition fuel uh, as we move toward greater renewable uh, direction for the Philippines. You talked about how the president made a pivot uh, to to uh, the U.S. Uh, because the people want him to. 90% of the people want him to. Will that translate to votes at the next election, you think? There is that uh, data also that shows that no national leader in the country can be elected if he appeases or subservient to China. That's why even the former president was playing with that name. He, we all know how he engaged with China, but there are some propaganda movements that positioned him as one standing up. That's why the last six months of President Duterte, he was defining the Duterte legacy as standing up. Mm. So you know how they're afraid of the Filipino people in the sense that this is an emotional issue for the Filipino people. It cuts across geographic and demographic profiles of Filipino voters. Right, Victor, thank you so much thank for that. You. Victor Manhead, President of Strat Base Institute. Keep it here with us. This is Bloomberg.
Welcome back to Bloomberg Markets Asia. A quick check on what we're seeing in crude. That we've seen it run up about 13% since the start of the year. Much of this has to do with price being supported by supply. OPEC Plus delivering supply cuts. The geopolitics of it all, uh, given the Ukraine strikes on Russian refineries as well. So that has supported the supply side of things. And we've seen a two-day gain. Uh, but that seems to be stalled today, dipping just below the 87.30 handle on Brent crude. Now, all eyes are certainly going to be on the Federal Reserve. And ahead of that, Carlisle Chief Strategy Officer of Energy Pathways, Jeff Curry, says he sees risks to the upside for oil if the Fed rate cuts come in the coming months. And he spoke exclusively with Bloomberg's Alex Steele during an energy conference in Houston. It was the beginning of the year I made the point, being short oil and commodities in a late cycle expansion is like being short natural gas in a blizzard. Don't do it. <laughs> um, a couple of things that you know, I just want to point out. Let's start with the U.S. Mm -hmm. The U.S. is running a 6% fiscal deficit, the largest deficit ever ran in history in a peacetime, non-recessionary environment. And think about this. If they do it in a recession, it's because of providing, let's say, unemployment insurance. They're doing it full employment, red hot economy, and they're turbocharging an environment that is already being stressed. That's why Bitcoin and commodities are the two best performing asset classes out there. So let's layer it in. What if we get Fed cuts uh, in the next few months? Are we turbocharging? Uh, yeah, the upside here is significant. And let's put on that, top of that what China is doing. They have their cash for clunkers um, program, plus they're stimulating everything from EVs to you know, batteries, solar plant panels. Why? Because they're trying to boost manufacturing off to set the weakness in uh, property. So you have a really strong China, and you can see that in the PPIs. They're crushing their margin if PPIs are going up. And then finally, let's turn to Europe. Remember that great destocking we were talking about last year? Mm -hmm. Well, they're restocking now. And so all of that points to a much more positive commodity price environment. Again, your late cycle expansion is when you want to be long commodities. Do you have a favorite? I always like oil and copper. <laughs> Actually, yeah, copper is the one I really like, and the reason why, not only is it part of the energy transition story, but what is AI? AI is chips and copper. You need copper to get the AI going. So how are you going to power all those chips? You need the electricity and you need copper. Yep, exactly. Electricity. That's a big talk uh, here in Houston as well. So, okay, so you like copper. You always like the oil. You always like oil. Just one more quick thing on oil. What's the upside, do you think? Um, if we're in sort of a, a range, it's going to be a volatile range. Is the upside 100? Is it triple dig is it digits? Is it really 90? What is it? Oh, well, let me ask you this. All the strength you've seen recently, and the consensus range is 70 to 90. Um, do you really want to be short $2.50 from here? Probably not. So I think we're going to see it bust well outside of that 70, 90 range. I don't want to speculate how high we go. It's not my job anymore these days. It's true. Um, but I think, you know, the risk is clearly the upside. I think the main point is I want to be long oil and the rest of the commodity complex in this environment. That's Carlisle Chief Strategy Officer of Energy Pathways, Jeff Curry, speaking exclusively to Bloomberg. And it's that countdown to the start of India's markets. We're watching out for the way the Nifty 50 opens uh, just above now the 28,860 level. Remember yesterday we saw that steep decline. And this is on the back of concerns about the froth, the overheating, particularly surrounding the small and medium caps uh, the level we were watching yesterday was 21 731 uh, if it goes below that that would be raising the gains for the year so far it looks like a bit of a recovery back to you Haas Well, April, there's breaking news right now. We have Supermicro uh, reporting pricing of offering of stock at about $875 uh, each. Of course, this is lower than uh, earlier anticipated. It is expected to have a gross proceeds uh, at about $1.75 billion. Of course, uh, Supermicro Computer guiding the potential investors in a sale of 2 million shares to a price of $875. That is below an earlier marketed range, according to people familiar 
there with the matter. Of course, this has to do with AI, the darlings of AI. And now we're seeing uh, expectations of uh, the price target being reduced to $875. Well, let's uh, pivot to India, get more on Indian markets with our Asia equities reporter, Chiranjeevi Chakravoti in Mumbai. CJ. Why are investors souring on India? We know that uh, uh, small cap stocks in particular have given up gains for the year. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's been a quite a bad month for small cap and mid cap stocks, which were flying quite high even at the beginning of the year, uh, building on what was a very stellar year in 2023. But it seems that the regulator has kind of intervened in the market. And, you know, they have pointed out concerns about exuberance, frothy valuations, and in just, uh, you know, uneasiness about the way the, the exuberance has been flowing out in smaller and micro cap companies in India and that has of course had an impact across the spectrum even large cap companies which though have not fallen as much as their smaller peers are also coming under pressure of course you have to also have some caveats here it is the end of you know the financial year in India and generally you t tend to see some sort of tax harvesting from investors and profit booking as well so that also is kind of stalling the momentum that we had seen earlier in the year in Indian equities. Uh, we know, CJ, that people were pumping money into India as an alternative to China. But now the likes of Manulife are saying, you know what, India will now underperform. It will lag behind China. Yeah, I mean, that seems to be the tactical, you know, position that increasingly more funds are looking to take. Uh, after the underperformance of China last year, I think it has come back quite strongly in February, you know, if you, as you know, uh, on the back of uh, support from Beijing. At the same time, in India, valuations are just not supportive if you're trying to take fresh, fresh positions, right? If you look at the MSCI, India is still trading at about 22 times, which is at a, quite a handsome premium to its long-term five-year average of roughly around 18 to 20. So at this point of time, I think the incremental gains probably are to be made in some of the North Asian markets and in China probably for some of the tactical investors, whereas India at this point of time seems to be taking the back seat after what was a very strong rally in 2023. So I would not be surprised that this remains uh, you know, the case going ahead. Of course, let's not forget we have an election coming, a national poll coming uh, in the next uh, six to eight weeks and investors are keenly watching out what the outcome of that will be as well. Perhaps, just perhaps, a reversal of fortunes there. CJ Chakraborty, Asia Actors reporter, we thank you for your insights. Now, still to come, Tencent poised to release its 2023 results later Wednesday. We'll look at what to expect and how 2024 is shipping up for the Chinese tech giant. Keep it here with us. This is Bloomberg. All right, all eyes on Tencent. Earnings report that's due later Wednesday may provide positive catalysts for its shares, which have plummeted about 60% from their record highs three years ago. For more, let's bring in Bloomberg Intelligence senior analyst Robert Lee. Rob, we may just see a surprise, yeah? Yeah, I think um, famous last words here, but the company is more likely to, or the numbers for 2023 are more likely to come in line, if not slightly ahead. I'm uh, not wanting to jinx myself on the market there, but, you know, it's been a really strong year for them. Stripping out the investment gains, we saw the company realise on the back of the sale of its Meituan and C Limited shares in 2022. On the like-for-like -like, uh, basis, the adjusted operating profit for the company should be up more than 30%. So it's a pretty stellar set of numbers there set to report for 2023, I think. And the market should take that quite positively. But it's all about the outlook, about, as you know. Hmm. How about 2024? That's right, the outlook. How's 2024 okay. looking? 
Yeah, well, I mean, um, the company's reporting somewhat late, uh, but that's not uncommon for Chinese tech companies, so they've almost got a quarter under their belt. But from what we can see so far, it's, um, you know, growth is normalizing because we, we don't have the, um, obviously last year benefited from the reopening of the economy and all that has washed through now. But, you know, earnings growth this year should be in the 15% range or thereabouts, according to consensus. And again, that ties in with our analysis. So given the size and scale of this company, that's, you know, it looks to have another solid year as growth normalizes. Now, you might say those sort of projected growth numbers do not match what's um, projected for the Magnificent Seven or NVIDIA, which is absolutely true. But equally, Tencent is not trading on those sorts of multiples. And given where the China market is at the moment, and given the relative underperformance of the stock, um, I think there's quite compelling risk-reward opportunity there for Tencent. So I think if the numbers are coming in line or ahead, and if their outlook into this year, driven by short videos, is upbeat, as we expect it to be, you know, I think the market should take that quite well. We know the game business isn't doing so well, right? I mean, you recently added Tencent to the BI focus list. Why is that? Yeah, again, for any, you know, my one or two readers who actually follow my research, I was quite cautious on them last year because I think there was a mismatch of expectations. With the economy reopening, people were looking, or some people in the market were looking for a return to business as usual. And business as usual being, you know, projected growth for 20 to 30 percent. I think that was unrealistic and we're not going to see that. But as I said, We've had significant underperformance in the stock uh, and also um, I think the market expectations on consensus are more realistic at the moment. And again, investing is all about risk reward. So I think there's quite a compelling opportunity there, um, which is one reason we added it to our focus list. So I think you know, this year's growth outlook looks relatively solid. This is not an Alibaba or an e-commerce play. The risk of their business being undercut by low-cost uh, rivals is, is relatively limited. And it's a well-diversified business with quite solid barriers to entry. So it looks to be a solid year, but more normalized growth in the 10 to 15% growth range. And at these sort of multiples, you know, I think that's fairly fair, to say the least. Yeah, and traders want them to be more proactive when it comes to returns. Bloomberg Intelligence Senior Analyst Robert Lee, we thank you so much for that. Before we go, let's do a check on how markets are doing. We know that Asia are under pressure, reversing those gains which we saw earlier this uh, as we anticipate that decision from uh, uh, the Fed. Of course, the Fed uh, after the BOJ, it is now about the Fed traders waiting to hear if the Fed will change its rate cut outlook. I mean, Asian shares are uh, having that at the back of their mind after S&P closed up, boosted by tech in particular, MAG7 in particular, and we've seen a rise in yields uh, and the dollar as well. It's all about whether or not the Fed validates that hawkish stance. Taking all the way we are in terms of the benchmarks here in Asia, Tyx up two tenths of one percent. And in terms of uh, the yuan, it is currently up about a tenth of one percent. Of course, we're keeping out for that rate decision out of Indonesia. It is likely to stand pat. It is waiting on the Fed. That is it from uh, Bloomberg Markets Asia. Bloomberg Daybreak and Middle East is up next. This is Bloomberg.